All right, today we're gonna to talk about air pollution. And in order to talk about air pollution, we need to first talk about what makes up our atmosphere, the gases that make up our atmosphere. So the highest proportion gas in our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, and that's in a proportion of 78.08%. Oxygen only makes up about 20, 0.95% of the atmosphere. And then you have argon gas, which makes up 0.93%. CO2 makes up 0.04%. And then water vapor makes up 0 to 4%, depending on the area. And in addition to that, you've got 40 trace gases. And these can include stuff like ozone, helium, hydrogen, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, neon. Um, and then you also have some aerosols. And we talked about aerosols when we were talking about the water cycle and how when you have condensation, those water, that condensated water needs something to stick onto, and that's aerosols. So aerosols can include microscopic liquid and solid particles like dust or carbon or pollen, sea salts, uh, and even some microorganisms. So then when we start talking about air pollutants, there's a couple things that matter. And one of the first things that matter are, is the actual amount of pollutants that are entering the air. But another thing that matters is the amount of space that it's dispersed into. If you have a lot of pollution that is dispersed into a small space, a more confined space, then that's gonna be obviously much more harmful than a lot of pollutants that are dispersed into a large area because they get more spread out and therefore less harmful. Um, and then the last thing that matters in terms of uh, factors that are determining the level of air pollution are mechanisms that can remove pollutants. So when we talk about this last bit, we're actually talking about um, some stuff that is naturally in the atmosphere that is capable of absorbing pollutants. And these are something called hydroxyl radicals. So hydroxyls will form like this, where ozone, O3, will react with UV radiation and create oxygen and then a free oxygen atom right here. And then this free oxygen atom can then combine with water to form a hydroxyl radical like this. And then this hydroxyl radical over here now, so then this hydroxyl radical over here can react with some pollutants like ammonia here or nitrous oxides here and yield end products like carbon dioxide, nitric acid, sulfur, sulfuric acid, and water. And then those end products like this one and this and this one right here, these nitric acid, sulfuric acid, um, and water can get flushed from the troposphere by acid precipitation. So they essentially become acids that get washed onto the earth and then out of the atmosphere. And in that way, these hydroxyl radicals are actually flushing, they're washing pollutants out of the atmosphere. So again, the degree of air pollution or the, the factors that determine the level of air pollution uh, are threefold amount of pollutants entering the air, the amount of space that those pollutants are dispersed into, and then mechanisms that remove these pollutants. And those mechanisms, mechanisms that remove the pollutants um, are these hydroxyl radicals, these OH molecules created by the breakdown of ozone and UV radiation. And then those hydroxyl radicals are capable of reacting with pollutants in the air which is becoming sulfuric acid, nitric acid, carbon dioxide, and then those can get um, transferred into precipitation and then actually washed out of the atmosphere. 
So now our next question is, where is air pollution coming from uh, in regards to like what we're putting into the into the atmosphere? So that include this when we talk about what we're putting into the atmosphere, we're talking about anthropogenic. Right, so anthro means human, and then genic generated, so human generated air pollution emissions. And what are the sources of human generated air pollution? So most of the air pollution generated by humans are direct or indirect products of combustion, so combustion burning stuff. So we burn coal, gasoline, liquid fuels, waste paper, um, plastic, and then that pushes pollutants into the atmosphere. So most of our air pollution comes when we're burning something. Right? So you can see here's, here's an incinerator right here burning some stuff. Here's cars that are burning fuels. Um, here's a coal burning power plant that's pushing this sulfur dioxide into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, we've got the production of carbon monoxide. Um, these acids like sulfuric and nitric acid are coming from the burning of fuels. Uh, and then you can also get the evaporation of volatile substances. So if you've ever been down at the gas station pumping gas, you smell that gas smell in the air, and that's actually the gas evaporating and creating that smell. Um, so the gas evaporating is a volatile substance, so it's an evaporation of volatile substances. Uh, and part of the problem with this anthropogenic air pollution is that it doesn't necessarily stay in one place. So when you burn something, you put it into the air, the, whatever that pollution is gets picked up by winds and can move that stuff all across the world. Um, and it's not just gases, you can also get the formation of particulates, which are little tiny particles in the air. So when we look at anthropogenic air pollution, here's the proportion of these five really important pollutants that are created by humans and sort of where they're coming from. So carbon monoxide coming mostly from on-road vehicles, right here. Right here. Um, nitrogen oxide also coming a lot from on-road vehicles or co uh, fuel combustion and electrical utility. Sulfur dioxide mostly comes from electrical utilities or the burning of coal. Volatile organic compounds mostly coming from on-road vehicles, but also some solvents that are being utilized. Um, and then particulate matter comes from lots of different stuff, different places. So maybe a little bit more surprising is that there are some sources of natural air pollution. So air pollutants that are coming from more natural places, not necessarily human generated. A lot of these natural air pollutants also come from burning. So one example would be forest fires like this. Another example be volcanoes. So volcanoes are producing a lot of sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides. Um, forest fires are producing particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide. Maybe a little bit more surprising is that natural air pollution can come from lightning strikes. So lightning strikes can actually create nitrogen oxides from atmospheric nitrogen. And then lastly, maybe even the most surprising, is that natural air pollution can come from plants themselves. So these are the Smoky Mountains. And the Smoky Mountains are called the Smoky Mountains because you've got the production of smog, um, which results from VOCs. So VOCs are volatile organic compounds and conif conifer trees, they get that um, nice like pine smell, like that nice Christmas tree smell. That Christmas tree smell is from volatile organic compounds like ethylene and terpenes um, that are produced by the trees and then those volatile organic compounds can react with some other stuff in the atmosphere and actually create smog. So the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Smoky Mountains are producing this natural smog, which is that smoke. So we have the Clean Air Act of 1970. So Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act gave jurisdiction of the atmospheric pollution to the EPA. And what it had to do is it had to uh, identify some criteria pollutants. 
and then it set regulations on the production of those criteria pollutants. So those criteria pollutants include sulfur dioxide, right, and these are important, these need, you need to know these criteria pollutants. So sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, ozone, and lead. Right? These are our criteria pollutants that are tracked and restricted by the EPA in this, from this Clear, Clean Air Act. And what you might notice is that carbon dioxide is not on this. Right? So carbon dioxide is an important thing to determine or to look at in regards to climate change, but it's not one of the criteria pollutants. These criteria pollutants are criteria pollutants because they significantly threaten human well-being, ecosystems, and structures. So the EPA specifies allowable concentrations of each pollutant in emissions. So here are some comparisons of 1970 in orange and then the 2011 emissions of these various criteria pollutants. So as you can see, all of them have gone down. Um, lead probably gone down the most. So why are these criteria pollutants? Again, they have to be harmful to human health or ecosystems. Right. So sulfur dioxide is a corrosive gas. Uh, it's, it comes from the combustion of fuels like coal and oil. And it, corrosive gas means it eats away at something. It's a respiratory irritant. So it's going to irritate our respiratory tissues, our lungs. Um, and it also affects plant tissues. So plants are affected by sulfur dioxides. And they're impacted because sulfur dioxide inhibits photosynthesis by disrupting this photosynthetic me mechanism. Um, the opening of the stomata, these little pores in the leaves, is promoted by sulfur dioxide, which results in uh, water loss. So nitrogen oxide, so you can get nitrogen oxide or dioxide, um, and the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen gas, which is N2. Uh, combustion in the atmosphere leads to the formation of nitrogen oxides which I'm gonna actually often write as like NOx, because it could be NO, could be NO2. Right? Um, and these are also a respiratory irritant and they can create smog uh, and also contribute to the formation of harmful ozone. Right? Carbon oxide, so carbon monoxide is formed when you get incomplete combustion of most matter. Um, so this is like vehicle exhaust where you get incomplete combustion. And what happens with carbon monoxide is it actually bonds to your hemoglobin. Right? So it bonds to your hemoglobin and doesn't allow you to then bond, bond oxygen, so you essentially suffocate. So they talk about how you're not supposed to leave your car running in a closed garage, and that's because you're creating carbon monoxide, and then that carbon monoxide will bind to your hemoglobin and essentially suffocate you. Particulate matter is really small particles or particulates. And to give you an idea of the size, this is 0 0.01 micrometers. So 0 0.01 micrometers to uh, about 100 micrometers. And a human hair is about 50 to 100 micrometers in diameter. So anything smaller than a human hair diameter. Um, larger than 10 micrometers can get filtered out by the nose and throat and are not regulated by the EPA. Um, and again, these can be solid or liquid particles that are suspended in the air, uh, resulting from combustion. So if you think about when you burn your campfire, you get little particles in that smoke uh, that are suspended in the air. Um, these can also scatter and absorb sunlight, which creates like this hazy sort of environment. Uh, lead is a trace metal that's found in rocks and soils, and there's a, there uh, are sm very small concentrations in fuels. Um, they were phased out as a gasoline additive uh, because they were getting released into the air when the fuel was burned. Uh, and then ozone, and we'll talk more about ozone later. Ozone is O3, right? impairs respiratory function, it's harmful to plants and animals, and it's a photochemical oxidant. Uh, so air pollutants are formed as a result of sunlight acting on these chemical 
compounds. Um, so it oxidizes stuff, which can then create secondary pollutants. So ozone can be directly effective by impairing your respiratory function, then it can be indirectly effective by uh, being this photochemical oxidant. So air pollutants are broken down into two main categories, primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. So we're gonna first talk about primary pollutants. So these are our primary pollutants. And primary pollutants are the direct products of combustion and evaporation. The direct products of combustion and evaporation. So that means you burn something and you immediately get these. Uh, something evaporates and you immediately get these. Right? If they were, if you were to then get these primary pollutants, if you were to produce these primary pollutants and then they underwent an, an additional reaction, then those are secondary pollutants. So if they undergo a reaction after they're burned, then they're secondary pollutants. So primary pollutants uh, are created immediately after something is burned or evaporated. So some of these really important primary pollutants are carbon monoxide, CO, and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a pollutant, uh, but it's not a criteria pollutant. So you kind of kind of categorize this a little bit. We've got our criteria pollutants that are regulated by the EPA. And then we have primary pollutants that can be criteria or cannot be criteria. Um, and they are the direct products of combustion and evaporation. So carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. We've got sulfur dioxide, right? So again, this sulfur dioxide was a criteria pollutant. We've got nitrogen oxides. So that was a criteria pollutant. We've got particulate matter, which was a criteria pollutant. And I'm going to abbreviate this as PM. And then we have VOCs, right? So VOCs were not a criteria pollutant, but stands for volatile organic compounds. Remember, these can come from the trees, uh, the conifer trees, or it can come from the evaporation of fuel. It's what you smell when you're at the gas station. So incompletely oxidized carbon will result in carbon monoxide. Completely oxidized carbon will result in carbon dioxide. Here are some of the main sources of these various primary pollutants. So carbon monoxide, incomplete combustion of fuel. So you see a lot of like vehicles that it's coming from. Volatile organic compounds coming from industrial processes because um, this is like evaporation of volatile compounds like fuel and solvents. Uh, and then nitrogen oxides, mostly from transportation, but also some electricity in industrial places. Um, sulfur dioxide, mostly coming from the burning of coal. And then particulate man matter is coming from all sorts of stuff. This is a little bit hard to read, but here's some more of that categorizing of different uh, primary pollutants. So you've got particulate matter right here. Oops, hold on. Right here, you've got all volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, car nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide. Uh, lead is also a primary pollutant um, from the burning of some fuels. Uh, and then you've got some other various air toxins and radon is another primary pollutant. So you have some primary pollutants that are uh, criteria pollutants like the sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, um, lead, and particulate matter. And then you have some that aren't criteria pollutants like carbon dioxide uh, and VOCs. All right, so that was primary pollutants. And then we have secondary pollutants. And this is where it gets a little bit complicated because we've got some chemical reactions that are happening. So secondary pollutants used to be primary pollutants, but then they undergo some kind of transformation in the presence of sunlight, water, oxygen, other compounds, and become something else. So secondary pollutants used to be primary pollutants that undergo a reaction in the atmosphere and create a secondary pollutant. So here are some of our secondary pollutants. You see ozone is on there, and ozone was a criteria pollutant. So ozone is the one criteria pollutant that is a secondary pollutant. And we, we have peroxyacetyl nitrates, or PAN, 
right? And ozone, you can see, comes from the reaction, all these say reaction, comes from the reaction between VOCs and nitrous oxides. So we'll talk about that in a second. These pans come from reactions between VOCs and nitrogen oxides. So VOCs and nitrogen oxides are both primary pollutants. When you get some reactions with those, then you get the production of ozone in pans. Sulfuric acid comes from oxidation of sulfuric dioc sulfur, uh, sorry, sulfur dioxide by OH radicals. So sulfur dioxide reacts with the OH radicals um, to create sulfuric acid. So sulfur dioxide is the primary pollutant, sulfuric acid is the secondary pollutant. And similarly, nitric acid is created by the oxidation of nitrous oxides by OH radicals. So you get, here's the primary pollutant, nitrous oxides, and then the, creates the secondary pollutant, nitric acid. So all of these are coming from reactions of primary pollutants. And then ozone is the really critical one because that is the criteria pollutant. Right. The others are important pollutants, but not criteria. So I want to talk a little bit more about ozone. So you might be thinking, well, I thought ozone was good because it blocks harmful UV radiation. And that depends on where the ozone is. So 90% of the ozone is in the stratosphere. Right, so here's the stratosphere up here. And the stratosphere is higher up in the atmosphere. Right? And then 10% of the ozone is in the troposphere which is closer to the surface of the Earth. And it is this tropospheric atmosphere ozone, this, at this ozone that's in the troposphere that can be harmful. So this ozone in the stratosphere is good because it blocks harmful UV radiation. This ozone in the troposphere closer to the surface of Earth is bad because that is a respiratory irritant. When you get chronic inhalation of ozone, you actually get inflammation and fibrosis of the lungs, so not so great. So how do we get this tropospheric or bad ozone? And it's formed up as the result of chemical reactions between nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds, these VOCs. And the process looks something like this. So I wanna kind of break this down a little bit. Um, this first part up here is, is sort of what's naturally supposed to happen, and this bottom part here is, is where we get this formation of ozone. All right, so when you have nitrogen oxides alone, so this first scenario, right, um, this is kind of the natural situation, right, what is supposed to happen, right? So here's our, here's our nice little nitrogen oxide. That nitrogen oxide gets hit by sunlight right here, right? And then the nitrogen oxide gets split into nitrogen oxide nitrogen dioxide gets split into nitrogen oxide, and then this atomic oxygen, so this little lonely oxygen atom. Uh, now, this atomic oxygen right here, this little lonely oxygen atom, doesn't like to be alone. Oxygen doesn't like to be by itself. It likes to be either um, as O2 or O3. So this little atomic oxygen, this lonely oxygen atom, will combine with oxygen that's in the atmosphere and create ozone. Right? And if this is happening in the troposphere, right, we don't want ozone there. Right? So ozone is, we don't want ozone to accumulate in the troposphere because it's, it's harmful. Right? So ozone will actually, in a natural situation, immediately combine back with this original nitrogen oxide. Right? So here you can see it combining with the nitrogen oxide and form nitrogen dioxide and oxygen. So this is a very cyclical loop, right? You start with nitrogen dioxide and oxygen and you end with nitrogen dioxide and oxygen, right? So when you have nitrogen oxides alone, you'll get the formation of ozone in the atmosphere, but then that ozone immediately gets broken down. So the ozone is not accumulating. These reactions are cyclical, right? The, the start ends up being the finish. So then this bottom scenario, this is what happens when we have nitrogen oxides and VOCs. So if you remember, this tropospheric oxygen, or sorry, tropospheric ozone uh, forms from reactions between nitrogen oxides and VOCs. So nitrogen oxides alone, not harmful. Now we have nitrogen oxides plus VOCs. And these are both, nitrogen oxides and VOCs are both primary pollutants that create this secondary pollutant ozone. Right, so in this scenario, you, you start off with nitrogen dioxide again, 
it gets hit by sunlight. And again, the nitrogen dioxide splits into nitrogen oxide and this little lonely oxygen atom, right? That lonely oxygen atom doesn't like to be alone, so it combines with oxygen gas here and forms ozone, right? Now, in this natural scenario over here, that ozone combined back with nitrogen oxide to create nitrogen dioxide again, so it was cyclical. But here, right, this ozone is formed, but it can't combine back with the nitrogen oxide. And that's because the nitrogen oxide gets tied up with these VOCs. So instead of, instead of the nitrogen oxide reacting with the ozone, the nitrogen oxide is reacting with VOCs and creating PANs and other stuff. So again, PANs are actually a harmful um, secondary pollutant as well. So now you have two harmful secondary pollutants being formed, ozone and PANs, which are both photochemical ox oxidants, um, they're which means they're highly reactive and can be damaging to plants and animals. All right. So natural scenario, you get the production of ozone, but then that ozone immediately combines back with Nitrogen, nitric oxide and doesn't accumulate. Here, that ozone that was formed can't combine back with the nitrogen oxide because that nitric oxide is tied up with these VOCs, is reacting with the VOCs instead. So since the nitric acid, or sorry, nitric oxide is reacting with the VOCs, then this ozone starts to accumulate, right? Because it can't, has nothing to react with. And then you get this accumulation of tropospheric ozone and you get the production of these PANs, these photochemical oxidants. Now that reaction between the nitrogen oxides and the volatile organic compounds and the sunlight also creates um, a, a type of smog called brown photochemical smog. Uh, this brown photochemical smog dominated by these oxidants like ozone and actually looks pretty brown. Here's a picture of LA. LA is known for being pretty smoggy. Um, and LA has a lot of traffic, a lot of car traffic that produces these nitrogen oxides, see, and organic com and volatile organic compounds that will then create this brown photochemical smog. The other type of smog is industrial smog. Industrial smog happens when you get burn uh, coal that has is burned and creates sulfur dioxide and particulates. That sulfur dioxide will then um, react with humid air, fog, water in the air, and create this gray industrial smog. So here's a picture of Hong Kong um, that has this uh, industrial smog from the burning of coal. And the haze that you see is this combination of smoke and fog, um, or soot and sulfurous compounds, and then water vapor. Um, so this is often where industries are really concentrated, like in Hong Kong. I don't know if any of you watched The Crown on Netflix, but there was one episode that actually talked about the Great Smog of 1952. It was also called the Big Smoke or the Great Pea Soup. So it was 1952, um, December 5th through 9th, and it was triggered by this period of really cold weather uh, where a lot of coal fires were being used to heat homes. Right? So uh, Industrial Revolution... Um, there was a lot of burning of coal. We don't burn coal as much, but in 1952, they were still burning quite a bit of coal in Great Britain. And then there was a, actually something called an anti-cyclone, right? So a cyclone is a lot of wind, so an anti-cyclone is windless conditions. So there were a couple things that combined to create this um, great smog, and that was this anti-cyclone, so this, these windless conditions, and then also a thermal inversion. So in a normal circumstance, normal scenario, you would have um, warm air at the surface of the earth down here that would just migrate up into the atmosphere, just like this. Right? Um, but sometimes you can get the, so because you know warm air moves up, right? but sometimes you can get a cold front, right? So this would be cooler air, cold air right here that moves in and actually will sandwich warm air and cold air. So you got cold air here, cold air down here, and then that sandwiches, because this cold air front moves in really quickly, that sandwiches this layer of warm air. So when the air from the surface is moving upwards, 
it will actually hit this warm air layer and get bounced back down. Right? So that's what happened with this great smog. You had cold air move in this front and it sandwiched a layer of warm air between cold air at the bottom because it's December, it was pretty cold. Um, and then any pollution, any air that was moving up from the surface got bounced back down and trapped underneath this layer of warm air. And then the windless conditions actually uh, caused it to become even more trapped because there was no wind to sort of move this out this way. So this uh, event, this great smog was pretty um, significant because about 4,000 people died, 100,000 people were made ill. Um, the total number of fatalities was probably even greater. And, uh, and especially because it was so cold, people just kept burning stuff to heat their homes and then accelerated the problem. And this, although this um, resulted in a lot of fatalities, it did uh, start to draw attention to air pollution and regulating air pollution. So I just want to talk about one more thing, and that's acid precipitation. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about ozone in class because we need to talk about the ozone hole and what has created the ozone hole, and, and that's going to be in the stratosphere versus the troposphere, right? So, but last thing I want to talk about is another secondary pollutant, and that is acid precipitation. So acid precipitation, we have two really important acids that are produced, and that's sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Right? And sulfuric acid is where sulfur dioxide gets oxidized by these OH radicals, and then you get the production of sulfuric acid. Right? So here's the primary pollutant right here, and here's the secondary pollutant. So primary pollutant, secondary pollutant. Right. Nitric acid is created by the oxidation of nitric oxides by OH radicals to produce nitric acid. And again, here's the primary pollutant, nitric oxides. Here's the secondary pollutant, nitric acid. So sulfuric acid and nitric acid will combine with rainwater, with with water that's in the clouds and actually precipitate out. And the precipitation of acid rain, when we talked about weathering, right, it accelerates weathering. So it can accelerate weathering of not just human-made structures, but also rocks. It can damage vegetation, as you can see down here, right here, Let's see, damage vegetation. It can actually leach into soils, right? So it can cause acid leaching into soils. Um, you can get it running into waterways and, and aquatic organisms dying because of it. So normal rainfall ha actually has a slightly acidic pH. So normal rainfall, normal rain, the pH is 5.6. And that's because CO2, carbon dioxide that's in the air, readily dissolves with the water in the air to produce carbonic acid. So normal rainfall actually has a little bit of carbonic acid in it, uh, making it slightly acidic. So any acid rain is going to have a pH less than 5.5, right? So 5.5 is the cutoff for acid rain. And to give you an idea of what this looks like across the US, so to give you an idea of like what this might look like, um, this is talking about hydrogen ion concentration. So higher amounts of hydrogen ions, higher relative amounts of hydrogen ions uh, is a lower pH, which is more acidic. Um, so this is from 1994, this is from 2010. So our acid rain is lowering. We're par a lot of that is probably because we're burning much, much less coal. So less production of sulfuric, gas, uh, sulfuric acid by the reaction of sulfur dioxides and um, hydrogen hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere. All right, that's it for right now. So when we meet in class, we're gonna talk more about some smog stuff, and then we're gonna talk about the ozone hole and, and how that ozone hole is produced.